Today, somebody who uh, just, I would say, comes under that list of people that I feel, I'm going to get now like some sort of politician, that make me feel good about Britain. But I would say he comes under that list of people where you go, oh, yeah, makes you smile. He's a, a, a column, a pillar within broadcasting and has been for as long as I can remember. And he's got a lovely voice. Need I say any more? It's Bob Harris. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Let's tell people... I mean, we've run into each other over the years when I've been at the BBC and, you know, I'm, I'm a fan, so I'll go, hey, hi, hello, and what have you. But then let's first of all say how we came a little bit closer. I was in Greece mm-hmm. with my friend Steve Coogan. Do you know him, the, the 90s Mancunian oh, yes, yeah. comedian? Yeah, vaguely, I'm, I, yes. <laughs> he's, he's faded a bit now, but... Um, <laughs> I visit him from yeah. time to time. And, and tell, us, tell us what happened from your point of view. Well, I, I'd been ill, yeah. uh, seriously ill. I'd suffered an aortic dissection. Well, what is that? It's, well, the, the, the aorta... If you don't mind talking about this, I mean, you just no, sat I'd, down and immediately were no, into I, this. No, I don't actually okay. mind talking about it at all. There's a good reason I don't also, because I am an ambassador for the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust now. Uh, the idea of which is to create more knowledge mm. of what is a fairly common but relatively unknown moment in people's lives. Particularly, it's strange because often when people have suffered a dissection, when they go to the local a e department, it's not recognised as a dissection. It's misdiagnosed in lots of other different ways. The aorta runs out of the heart and comes down the centre of the body. It's basically the M1 yeah. of the body because it, it, it's the, the artery that takes all the blood to everywhere. Everything runs off it. So if you get a tear in it, which is what happened to me, it potentially can be very, very serious. And I was really, really poorly. And then, um, out of the blue, I get a message from you and from Steve just offering me your support and saying, you know, get well soon. It meant the world, Rob, seriously. It really did. It it was a massive um, stepping stone in my recovery path. Well, the reason that we did it was we were there filming the trip to Greece and this must have come up on a social media or news and we saw it. I mean, oh my God. And such is the effect that you had had on us Mm. as we were growing up. And I think Steve said in the message, you you curated music. That's what he said. Yeah, and I thought that was, uh, you know, unusually apt from him. Um, It was... (laughs) You had, you had curated <laughs> music and you had sifted through the rubbish and brought us the good stuff. And when you do that, you become a very important figure in people's lives. And you must experience this a lot. You must meet a lot of people who have a lot of affection for you. Well, a lot of people who say, you know, I've grown up with your music kind of thing, that you were the person that be, sort of pointed me on on my pathway into appreciation of different sorts of music, you know, right back from the days of the old Grey Whistle Test, you know. So at gigs and particularly when there, where there's music gatherings where uh, we're all there kind of for the same reason. Yeah. On occasions like that, a, a lot of people do come up to me and we have the most fantastic conversations. You mentioned the Whistle Test. I'm fascinated by the change in the music business, all the media, Mm. accessibility being one of them. When you were on the whistle test and Mm. you were bringing us interviews with Elton John, James Taylor, I mean, any number of artists, it was a different world because because these people had a magical, mysterious quality. We didn't have access to them. That's right. I mean, at the time, whistle test was really the only program of its type on tv there were two music shows in the 70s one was top of the pops and the other was the okay whistle test but at the time whistle test was it if you were into album music the one place to go to discover these new artists was the okay whistle test and they were new artists they were in those days i mean i've got quite a big 
selection of old scripts and everything else at home now, which uh, I've got an archive on my yes, website. Yes, you have. Yeah, yeah. It's which, fascinating. Which, um, highlights some of these. And reading back, Rob, through the scripts, it's honestly like reading through the history of album music in real time. Because when we're playing a track by the Eagles, let's say, I'm introducing this group yeah. for the first time on UK <laughs> TV and giving their background, t- telling everyone their history and introducing people to tracks from their first album and things like that. The first <laughs> album. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, and you go through then that whole sequence of those amazing artists at that time. You know, now looking back at it, it, it does feel incredible. I parachuted down into a world that I loved so much, you know, that we, there we were in LA or wherever it was, you know, hanging out with the Beach Boys. I mean, that's how it all started because I went hanging over to... Hanging out with the Beach Boys? I went over to LA with Jeff Griffin, radio producer, to um, record material for the Beach Boys story for Radio 1, mm. which does still occasionally surface this yeah. series on Six Music. Right. And uh, I found myself in the middle of the LA rock scene. Yeah. I just literally, I started the first evening we were there, Alice Cooper came over to the hotel to meet us in a, he, he was wearing um, golfing trousers, yeah. check golfing trousers, white shirt. He'd just come off the golf course having played around with Johnny Mathis. I mean, I love that. What, what, you, I love that. A least likely combination. You can't imagine. But I love it really. when you find out that people from different parts of show business know each other. Because to me, it just reinforces it's all this umbrella of people entertaining. That's people. right. That's all it is. Yeah. And you often find a very, what you might call unlikely friendships, but they're doing the same thing. Yeah. They're going out and entertaining. We're all on the same side, aren't it's, we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your beautiful, beautiful voice is the thing that uh, people often pick up on. But let's put it to the test, Bob, because I've written down something here. I've written down something unpleasant that I'd like you to say. Right. And I want to. I mean, when I say unpleasant, it's not horrible, don't worry. Um, that I'd like you to say, because I've got to have gimmicks, haven't we, in, in, in these uh, interviews. We, we need a gimmick. We've been very gimmick-free. So I think if you read this, can you read my writing? I've done it in capitals. Yeah, like if you read that and take your time to have a little look through it, I think in your voice it would be acceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, just to say that we've had a system failure and we're plummeting to certain death. I think just your voice has taken the edge off that. (laughs) I think if I were on that plane, I would turn to my wife and my children and I would say, it's not what we wanted, but wasn't that lovely? (laughs) I think... I think I would. Let's talk about the wider radio world. Um, Because I don't know if you know, but I I started in radio as a DJ on Radio Wales. Mm. Grew up with a a big interest in it. You did lots of radio stations, didn't you? Yes, I do. Uh, Well, Radio Wales, and and then a show that also went on to Five Live, as it was then. I didn't realise till I I read up on you how many different stations you've worked for. You've, yeah, got, you've been at a lot of stations. The 70s and the 80s, the 80s in particular, Rob. Mm. I mean, you know, when I came off uh, Whistle Test in seven, the end of 79, it was so funny, actually, because the last national broadcast I did for the BBC was on New Year's Eve, um, December 79 into January 1980, Blondie on stage at the Apollo in Glasgow. And the next first regular uh, broadcast I, I did on National BBC was on the 6th of April, 1990. So I, in my broadcasting career, the 80s yeah. were, just did not exist. I, I remember when uh, Matthew Bannister and I talked about, because when they did the cull at Radio 1 in Matthew Bannister was the controller? And Matthew Bannister was the controller who came in to take over from Johnny Beerling. Oh, yeah, yeah. To, 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 to get rid of all the old dinosaurs and things like this. So Matthew Bannister had me, um, <laughs> he said, uh, I'm taking you off air. I mean, this is it. That's yeah. what he said. Just, I, I, I'm taking your programme off. <sighs> so, right, okay. You know, and I'm sort of expecting him to say, 
we'll we're finding you something at the weekend. Or so uh, I said, what, taking, taking me off Radio 1? He said, yes. He said, we've decided to broaden the musical uh, base on the overnight programme. And I went, wait, you haven't listened. Yeah. You have not heard my show. Yeah. Because yeah. of all the programmes on Radio mm. 1 at the time, yeah. mine was probably the most eclectic. I think it mm. almost, me and Phil Swern were putting it together. Oh, yeah. Literally hand building yeah. it every yeah. day. And uh, four hours, we were going all over the place with it. I just knew that that was not the real reason. Yeah. Uh, but he, he had a list of, of, of names, you know, that the red line oh, was going through. No. And mine was at the top. I mean, it, it might have been alphabetical order. You know, Bob would be close to the top. You, you may not have been the worst offender. You may just have been, you know, I don't know, it was Andy Kershaw there at the same time because he'd have been above you. He got in touch with me about 10 days later and said, I'm sort of owning, I hadn't listened to your show. You know, I was given this list of, of you know, this is the hit list. Yes. But he said, now that I've listened to your program, he said, I really love it. He said, you're right, it, it's eclectic, it's interesting, it takes you different places. You know, one of the things about putting programmes together, Rob, that I've always loved is what I call the flow-through. Yeah. In other words, this track that I'm playing is going to lead yeah. in some way to the next There's a one. reason and for the that, next then one. There's a reason, that's, yeah. that's the word. There's a reason for playing this track next to that track, next to that track. So, but Matthew said, okay, I would like to say that I'd love to help you in any way I can, you know, maybe, a, you know, put in a good word for you at Radio 2 and all of this. All right. And But he's been good to his word. He has been ever since. Right. And he and I became very good friends. I mean, the <laughs> chap that fired me off Radio 1. <laughs> but now it seems to me that you've been a fixture at the BBC for a, quite a while now. So when did that happen? Well, I wanted... So I it was... a. It was, this is bittersweet. You know, one of my DJ heroes was Roger Scott. Yeah. I think Roger was, you know, again, I learned as much from Roger as anyone. Anyway, he became very ill, he got cancer. And Johnny Beerling, who was the controller of Radio 1 at the time, took Roger down to his house in Southeast Spain. I was doing weekly programs at the time for BFBS, the British Forces Broadcasting Service. And um, that time that Johnny was down uh, at his house with Roger, he heard my show coming out of Gibraltar and he loved it. Oh. He hadn't heard me for years and he yeah. loved it. And he, he came back to the UK and in his mind he thought, right, I've got Roger's successor. Yeah, And Phil and I became a really powerful combination of... You know, the music that we chose, the, the way that we built the shows. So I went back to Radio 2, in other words, well, back to Radio 1, rather, at the beginning of 1990. Johnny put me in as replacement for Roger on that Sunday evening slot and then put me on the late show, 12 till 2. Mm. And then when the Gulf War was uh, um, announced, I was on air um, and we stayed on air because if, if you can believe it, Radio 1 used to shut down between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, in those days. In the early 90s, there was that gap in the middle of the night where it, yes, it wasn't broadcasting. I'd forgotten that. But we stayed on air and it yeah. gave Johnny the opportunity, the, the sort of bridge to say, right, we should be on air 24 hours a day. And that was the and reason. And that's how it started, yeah. And then so he offered me the what we called the midnight to morning yeah, yeah. start. And yeah. that's where I was at the point when Matthew came in and said, oh, <laughs> God, he's got his, it's a snap, isn't it? It Whoa, really is. Whoa, here we Abs go. Absolutely. Hold on tight. Yeah, yeah. God. But you know, it's, it's, it's been stable since I've been at Radio 2, though, yeah, thank goodness, yeah. and I love it. Though, Good, so. and long may it continue. Yeah. Bob, what a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, Rob, it's been wonderful. I've been looking forward to this so much. And also, again, you know, to thank you for that message that you sent me, you and Steve, you know. Um, what what I'm doing now, and I'm sure you see this on my Instagram, having come through yeah. such a difficult moment uh, and come out through the other side, I'm hoping that people who read my sort of almost day-by-day -day blogging, which mm. I kind of do on Instagram, can demonstrate to them that however difficult things get in a dark moment, as George Harrison said, all things must pass, yeah. you know, and you yeah. can come through it. Just try and be the best version of yourself every day that you possibly can. 
Um, and part of the revelation of, of this feeling was your message from uh, Greece with Steve to think that I'd got your support and you both cared so much was a huge moment in my, my recovery. So I just want to say thank you very, very much. Well, really thank you. Thank you very much. It's, mm. uh, it was just our little way of saying thank you to you. So, hey, look, we're just going to have a, you know, this is a mutual admiration <laughs> now. And, and, and you may be feeling left out at this stage. You may be thinking, well, what, what about me, Rob? I want to thank you. as well. Bob, do you want to thank them I as well? I do, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for all yeah. the support through yeah. all the years. I want to thank you for the support you've given me. <laughs> it's meant a lot to me. Not so much you, but, but certainly you. <laughs> Bob, thanks so much. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>